Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of a Blueprint for Revolution. How to use rice pudding, Lego men, and other non-violent techniques to galvanize communities, overthrow dictators, or simply change the world. And this is by Sergio Popovich and Matthew Miller, a non-fiction book. And really, it does what it says on the tin there. There is a big old blurb down here on the back, which I, I guess I'll read to you. But you can kind of already get a feel straight away whether it's going to be your kind of thing or not really. So anyway, how do ordinary people become revolutionaries? In 2000, too cool to care Belgrade rock kid Sergio Popovich found himself at the centre of a movement which was about to change the world. Popovich was one of the unexpected leaders of the student movement Oppor that overthrew dictator Slobodan Milosevic and established democracy in Serbia, all by avoiding violence and opting for something far more powerful, a sense of humour. In this inspiring and entertaining guide for would-be activists, he tells his story and those of other ordinary revolutionaries who have created real social change using non-violent techniques. So this is a non-fiction book and it's, it is a guide for revolutionaries basically about how to wage peace, peaceful protests and some of the examples of that uh, here for example the rice pudding basically this was where the rice pudding was almost a national dish and the government imposed huge taxes on it and so people responded by protesting by not buying the rice puddings and they started to you know go moldy basically on supermarket shelves and eventually you know the government had to back down and it's this small act of backing down that proves that you know what seems to be an impenetrable you know um, all, all powerful tyrannical government isn't actually as powerful as it may seem so there was another example of that as well where um, uh, basically protesters released some pigs and then the police were chasing the pigs but bearing in mind this is in you know I can't remember exactly which country it was that might have been in uh, Serbia during that time either way it was uh, a time when the police were to be feared you know but suddenly everybody sees them running down the village high street trying to catch these pigs and suddenly they're laughing at them and suddenly a lot of that fear is gone. So it's quite almost psychological in ways. Um, there was another example from this that I thought was interesting where they were talking about, and this was for Oppor, which is um, Sergio Popovich's, uh, his organization. And basically they went out of their way to make people who joined them seem like rock stars. So... You know, they'd walk into a bar and they'd instantly be getting free drinks on the house. You know, there'd be girls all over them. Um, and this would be, basically, they did this by, if you got arrested 10 times, you got a certain colour t-shirt. If you got arrested 25 times, you got a certain colour t-shirt. And basically, these t-shirts became objects of pride. And suddenly, people basically wanted to get arrested for the cause because it made you seem so cool, you know? The Lego men that are described here on the front, this was when I think in Egypt there were uh, rules against having um, gatherings of more than six people and so they staged a protest of Lego men with thousands and thousands of Lego men holding little tiny placards. So it is quite interesting, It's a lot of this is about thinking outside the box. So I read this as a real life buddy read with my uh, girlfriend and it was very very good. Uh, I read it faster than she did and I think I enjoyed it a bit more. I, we, we both did pick up though that like it does have this feel where it doesn't feel as though it's a cohesive book from start to finish it often feels as though almost a series of different essays that have all been kind of brought together and so there are even points where um, there was a he mentioned somebody in, on page 30 or so and then on page 55 he said I don't know if you've ever heard about so and so and of course we have because he's already mentioned him so that could have been tightened up a little bit with the editing uh, other than that though I wasn't too put out by that and it does make sense that they do feel like isolated different essays almost because um, they're about different regimes and so we'll first look at you know what happened in Serbia and then we'll look at um, Egypt so it's just interesting to sort of see what how, how different things happen around the world let me take a look at some of the uh, flags that I put in here as well so talking about the idea of the importance of humor in uh, protest uh, the author said uh, Try to think of the best way to reassure a friend who is about to be wheeled into an operating room for major surgery. If you act serious and concerned, his anxiety will spike. But if you crack a joke, suddenly he will relax and maybe even smile. The same principle is true when it comes to movements. Here's a great example from uh, how people sort of show disobedience uh, under Pinochet in uh, Chile during the 1970s. So it says, um, instead of trying to swarm the streets, they started encouraging taxis to drive at half speed. And suddenly all of the taxis were at half speed, all the traffic was gridlocked, and it sent out this powerful message without directly breaking the law or directly standing up against the, re the regime. 
He also um, mentions Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien as kind of an inspiration to him. The idea of even in the greatest hours of darkness, there is still some light. And the idea of these small heroes like Sam Gamgee and uh, Frodo Baggins. And I think that's quite an interesting way to look at it as well. Like anybody can, anybody can be a hero. Anybody can start a revolution. As long as the cause is good and just, you know. And here we go. That boycott was actually... Um, cottage cheese or well basically any dairy products so um so uh we've got here um israelis vowed to punish the behemoth they didn't stop at cottage cheese now chocolate milk shoko the national addiction of israeli children gazed longingly from supermarket refrigerators as previously loyal consumers sneered while passing it by smoothies went unsipped swiss cheese grew moldy around water coolers in offices all over israel people boasted about their commitment to go dairy free it was the world's first case of politically motivated lactose intolerance. And it worked. Within two weeks, the large supermarket chains, panicking over a noticeable drop in profits, announced that they would place all cottage cheese-related products on sale. I'm going to read this little excerpt as well. I thought this was interesting. So, uh, his, he has a partner called Slobodan. No relation to Slobodan Milosevic. It's the same given name, you know, first name. First, Slobo explained, whether you're fighting Milosevic's or Assad's, their strength will always lie in their ability and readiness to engage in violence. It's the one thing that these regimes excel at, and these guys have trained armies at their disposal. So a violent campaign against the dictator already starts out at a disadvantage. You're attacking the enemy where he is strongest. If you're up against David Beckham, Slobo said, you don't want to meet him on the soccer field. You want to play him at chess. That's where you can win. Taking up arms against the dictator is a silly way to face him down. I think this is interesting as well because he does specifically address kind of how to go about being non-violent too. And so uh, let me read this, this paragraph out here and then we'll close out with a rating. So, during the Oppor campaigns, we Serbs were clever enough to realise that by putting the most beautiful girls in the front ranks of our marches, we minimised the chance of the police beating us from the get-go, as even the sadistic security forces were reluctant to start their day by roughing up women. And by having girls in the first rows of protesters, we were able to create a physical buffer between the cops and those on our side who were most likely to tussle with the police, rowdy young men. Oppor members would also constantly play instruments, dance to music from loudspeakers, and call on officers to join our movement in order to show that we were not there to threaten the cops. In fact, we sang songs in honour of the police at our protests, mostly the same cheesy patriotic songs that we sing to our beloved but lousy national soccer team and we deputised student volunteers who were identified by red ribbons on their sleeves as protest police working to isolate potential troublemakers in our ranks before they could get violent with the police or one another. So I just thought that was interesting that they took steps against, you know, going into violence because they knew that would damage their message. So all in all, I'm going to give this a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5. It's very good for what it does. Um, it could have been better written at times, but... If you purely want the information, there aren't many better books to go for, I don't think. And I did enjoy it, so uh, check it out if that sounds good to you. So on that note, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought about it. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.